When we think of sinister neighbours, we usually think about dogs that won't stop barking, or those neighbours who play loud music all through the night. But Lauren Giddings' neighbour was a creepy social recluse. He obsessed over her. This neighbour was the most unassuming predator, yet the one we should be most fearful of. Living among the students at Barristers Hall Apartments in Macon, Georgia, was a killer. It was Thursday morning, June 30th, 2011, and it was garbage collection day. Usually, the garbage truck is punctual. It arrives on time, scoops up the bins, and moves on. But this particular morning was a little different. Not only were the garbage men a few minutes late, but just moments before the truck arrived, a pair of Macon, Georgia police cars inadvertently blocked the bins. Detectives were called to investigate a missing person report called in early that morning. Five days prior, 27-year-old Mercer Law School graduate Lauren Giddings had not contacted her friends or family since the evening of June 25th. The police weren't blocking the trash bins deliberately. They had parked there by chance. Once the garbage truck arrived, the driver realised the bins were inaccessible, so he simply waved at the detectives and kept driving. Shortly after... The police knocked on the door of Stephen McDaniel, Lauren's next-door neighbour in the A-Unit apartment building. He was asked a few routine questions about his missing neighbour, then left alone as the police carried on their investigation. Stephen agreed to appear on the evening newscast several hours later during the most bizarre curbside interview with a local television station. Yeah, Lauren was my neighbour. Um, we're just trying to find out where she is at this point. I mean, no one has seen her since Saturday. I mean, the last time anyone heard from her was an email that she sent out, and I mean, no one's heard from her since. And did you see her hang out with anyone at the time, anything like that? I mean, no, no, no one has seen her since Saturday. I haven't seen anything. I mean, I've always hear noise outside, but it's just people walking by pretty much. And you, uh, she just recently graduated from Mercer? Yeah, she and I were, we were both JD students. Um, we graduated back in May. What kind of person was she? I mean, how did you, what did you see? I mean, she's as nice as can be. I mean, very personable, very much a people person. Do you know anybody that, any enemies she might have had, somebody that might want to hurt her? No, I mean, we all know where she is. It's easy to pass him as a regular person. Although he looks disheveled, presumptuously, this is because his friend Lauren Giddings was missing. Still, for the most part, he was able to keep it together for the interview. At one point, he even speculated on what may have happened to Lauren, suggesting she may have been snatched while out running. The only thing we can think is that maybe she went out running and someone snatched her. Because, I mean, we went, at, we went over, one of her friends had a key, we went inside and tried to see if there was anything amiss, but, I mean, she had a door jam that was sitting right by it, so there was no sign that anyone broke in. However, Stephen was about to get slapped in the face as a reporter tells him the missing body has been discovered in the car park behind the law school. I mean, the door was locked when everyone got here. I mean, we, we just don't know where she is. What about um, in the, like, the parking lot area? I know they've been doing a lot of, I think that's where they have recovered the body or whatever they recovered from there. Body? Um, had you heard, had you seen anything there? Had you seen anything there? All right. I mean, we don't know if this is the same person. You know what I mean? Like, they took out a body there earlier. We don't know if it's the same person or not. So that's why we're trying to ask people if they know who lived there. Are you okay, sir? I think I need to sit down. Okay. Stephen's demeanor changed completely. It's at this point he knew he was in trouble. Stephen was expecting the garbage truck to come around and pick up the trash, along with Lauren's dismembered body. What he didn't know was that the garbage never got emptied. At this moment, Stephen's head would be spinning after absorbing such information. He was shocked after discovering his plans failed and that his days as a free man were likely over. As we'll come to learn, it's quite clear that Stephen McDaniel would not have stopped with the murder of Lauren Giddings, and it's highly likely that there would have been more victims. Pay attention to some of Stephen's peculiar behaviour, and we can start to speculate that Stephen McDaniel was, in fact, a serial killer in the making. It was clear that Stephen McDaniel was a primary suspect in Lauren Giddings' murder from the very beginning. As we proceed, you'll understand why the detectives almost immediately identified Stephen as a primary person of interest. 
Stephen McDaniel made it relatively easy for detectives from the very start, even though he attempted to pull off what he thought was a perfect murder. Stephen made several mistakes that he couldn't cover up, and like most other narcissistic killers who are caught, he quickly realised that he wasn't necessarily smarter than everyone else, including his pursuers. A pair of students from Mercer Law School graduated in May of 2011 who were familiar with each other but didn't really know one another. For about three years, the two lived right next door to one another. They even shared a common stairway to their second floor residence at the Barista's Hall apartment complex, right across the street from the college campus. Apart from that, they had nothing in common. 27-year-old Lauren Teresa Giddings was a native of Laurel, Maryland and had blonde curly hair. Among her friends, classmates and family, she was known for being athletic, cheerful, outgoing and social. Upon graduating from law school, she planned to pursue a career as a lawyer in the nearby city of Atlanta. All that stood between her and her dream was a Georgia bar exam. David Vanderveer, a corporate lawyer in Atlanta, was Lauren's steady boyfriend. Their relationship began in 2007 when Lauren accepted a position as a project assistant at the Atlanta Law Office where David worked. David planned to propose to Lauren in Bermuda shortly after graduation on a surprise trip later that fall. Lauren was unaware of this plan. The character of Stephen Mark McDaniel was a stark contrast to Lauren's. He was 25 years old and very different from Lauren, his friendly and social neighbour. Stephen was born and raised in Lilburn, Georgia, northeast of Atlanta. It was said that he was an odd character on campus. His behaviour and interactions with others were generally antisocial, withdrawn and eccentric. Aside from being quirky, he was also very smart, according to those who knew him. His apartment on the second floor was his place of retreat, his place to be alone. As a 25-year-old, he was an essentially reclusive person staying inside most of the time playing video games, watching pornography, and carrying his guns and swords. Stephen was a prepper who collected food and supplies on the basis of survivalism. In addition to empty containers, he also collected soda bottles, large plastic jugs, and even the cardboard centres of toilet paper rolls. Lauren had been Stephen's interest from the beginning, but it was a one-way street. He asked her out at least a few times, but had always been rejected. After all, she already had a boyfriend. Lauren would not have accepted Stephen's advances even if she was not in a relationship. He was viewed by her as a creepy neighbour who rarely left the house. It is also important to note that Lauren was never afraid of Stephen McDaniel. At least, she never mentioned to anyone that she was scared of him. What Lauren did not know, however, would have indeed frightened her. The inability to have her led Stephen to obsess over Lauren which manifested itself in some secretive and troubling behaviour next door to Lauren's apartment. Detectives reviewed Stephen's internet browsing history early on in the investigation, which revealed some disturbing patterns. Approximately two months before he killed Lauren, Stephen searched for nude Lauren Giddings on Google. He also viewed Lauren's Twitter feed. Later, he repeated several searches with variations of the phrase, molest sleeping girls. The very next day, he searched for the phrase, choked, unconscious, how long, wake up. Since May 1st, he was looking for ways to escape prison. He became increasingly obsessed with Lauren Giddings during May and June. In the same time period, he browsed websites to find nude photos of celebrities, advertisements for local escorts, dating sites, read erotic fiction, and viewed pornographic material. Using the screen name Soul, which stands for Son of Liberty, he posted graphic sexual content online which described torture and violence against women. He also looked at guns and sex toys. By June 3, 2011, he had examined Lauren's Amazon.com wishlist. On June 7, 2011, he was searching a photo sharing website for Lauren Giddings' account. On June 8, 2011, Stephen reviewed Lauren's LinkedIn profile and her Facebook profile. While none of these searches were illegal, they paint an increasingly dark picture of Stephen McDaniel's character in the months leading up to Lauren's murder. In July, Lauren spent her final afternoon poolside at Healy Point Country Club in River North, and then around 5.48pm she used a credit card to purchase dinner from a Zaxby's drive through on her way home. Video footage of her reaching for her order from the drive through window captured her arm outstretched. This was the last outside interaction that anyone had with Lauren before she was attacked and murdered early on Sunday morning, 
June 26, 2011. For the next five days, no one knew where Lauren was except for her killer. Lauren was a socially active individual. How could she have gone unnoticed for nearly a week? She informed her family and friends that she was taking the bar examination in Georgia. Therefore, she received the privacy she required to prepare for the test. It would have been understood by everyone close to her why she had been confined to her apartment, locked out, and temporarily unavailable. She was not to be disturbed. Stephen McDaniel browsed Lauren's Facebook page again in the afternoon of June 25th, the evening before he snuck into Lauren's apartment and murdered her. Just before her murder, on June 26, he repeatedly searched for ways to break Lauren Giddings' door-jamming burglar bar, which she used to keep out intruders. Where did Stephen learn what was behind her closed door inside her apartment? The chilling footage you just watched was a video camera duct taped to the end of a six foot wooden stick as he stood at ground level surveilling Lauren's room late at night. It was taken just a few hours before Lauren's murder. With the camera, he scanned the interior of her apartment, paying attention to her front door and the burglar bar that secured it. He wanted to find a way to defeat the device that stretched from the floor to the doorknob. This footage offers a glimpse at the painstaking steps he took to slip inside her apartment. Stephen and the other tenants of an eight-unit apartment building were asked by the detectives to search their apartments. Stephen declined. According to him, he had several firearms in his apartment and he did not want anyone near them. The detectives grew increasingly suspicious as they spoke with Stephen. The detectives repeatedly pressured Stephen to allow them to search his apartment and he was told that everyone else living in the building except him had consented to the search. Finally, Stephen succumbed to the pressure and allowed Detective Patterson access to his apartment to search for the missing woman. Detective Patterson then asked Stephen to stand up and lift his shirt to check for any marks he may have had on his body. Stephen had two red scratches on the right side of his abdomen, which he could not explain. Patterson said the marks looked like fingernail marks, but Stephen did not know where or when he received them. The officers walked through Stephen's apartment after photographing the scratches. On the morning of June 30th, police discovered a body in a trash bin right outside of Lauren's apartment after noticing a foul smell coming from the area. They searched the area for the rest of the remains, but were unsuccessful. Stephen was still unaware that the torso had been found as of mid-afternoon on June 30th, about 1.30pm. As far as he knew, the trash earlier had been removed that morning before the detectives arrived. Detective Patterson and an investigator from the district attorney's office went through Stephen's apartment to search for Lauren. Even so, they were reasonably confident that they had found her torso earlier that morning. In addition to a samurai sword and several large knives, Stephen possessed a semi-automatic rifle and a pair of handguns. He also had a large cooler near the front door. Until now, Stephen was allowed to remain in his apartment during the search, but he was asked to leave at a certain point to allow them the space they need to do their work. At that time, a local news crew waved Stephen over as he was heading towards the Mercer Law School campus on the other side, leading him to the interview you heard earlier. Those who watched this brief interview on television that evening, including the detectives now assigned to this case, would remember and pay attention to what unfolded during that interview. In combination with his other theatric displays throughout the day, Stephen's strange on-air performance made him an immediate person of interest in the case. During his search of Stephen's apartment, Detective Patterson found not only knives and guns, but also a few other important pieces of evidence. A master key that opens all doors in the apartment complex, as well as an apartment key specific to Lauren's apartment. A pair of trousers with Lauren's DNA were found in Stephen's bedroom, along with a stolen flash drive containing hundreds of her personal photographs. 
The apartment complex's laundry room contained a bloody sheet and a hacksaw with flesh attached that was found in a locked cupboard in the laundry room. A DNA test confirmed that the blood on the saw was Lauren Giddings. Stephen's apartment also contained packaging for the hacksaw. Videos showing the inside of Lauren's apartment were removed from Stephen's camera in the days following her death, but they were recovered by the investigators years later, just before Stephen was to stand trial. Furthermore, the prosecutors also had child pornographic images that had been stored on a flash drive, which added 30 counts of child sexual exploitation to the charges against him. Stephen McDaniel was brought in for interrogation. And things just got a whole lot weirder. Earlier, Stephen was overly forthcoming with information in his TV interview. You couldn't stop him from talking. However, once he knew he was a suspect, he was a completely different person. This interrogation that you're about to watch will highlight traits of serial killer material. When was the last time you seen her? Two or three weeks ago. Okay. Was you friends with Lauren? Yes. Look at me and talk to me, son. Okay? Was you friends with her? Yes. Who do you think took Lauren away? I don't know. Well, I need your help. I mean, earlier today, me and you sit here and talk normal. What's going on with you now? Why are you acting like this? I need to know. Why all of a sudden you're acting like this? Hmm? I don't understand. Okay. Earlier today we sat here and talked. But now you're acting like you don't know what's going on. Hmm? I mean, did something happen or something to you? I mean, why are you not, why are you shutting down? Why are you not talking to me? I don't know. You don't know? Are you scared? No. If you know something, because I need to know. Because her family's down here want to know what happened to her. I don't know. You don't know? No. That's what you want me to tell her mother and her father, is that you don't know. I don't know. Not that you're sorry that she's missing. Not that you've been trying to help me all day find her, but you just wanted me to tell her I don't know. I don't know. Are you a sorry piece of shit that you want me to tell her that? You sure stood out there and ran your mouth to the news media. But now you're going to get out here and you don't fucking know. You know. You're just a sorry piece of shit that don't give a fuck. Right? No. Where's Lauren? I don't know. Yes, you do know. You do know. You do know. You know. You know. You do know. What'd you do, buddy? I didn't do anything. What'd you do to Lauren? I didn't do anything. So you're telling me, see that pretty girl right there? Yes. You're telling me you looked at a pretty girl like that and you never once thought, ever? Man, she looks good. You never thought that? I don't understand. <laughs> Steve. You gonna look at this right here, this little girl right here, and you gonna say you don't know? I know you know. I don't know. Yes, you know. What are you gonna say tomorrow when I say we got your hair with the body? What are you gonna say to me then? Because you know what I go like that? Look at my hair. That's how easy it falls out. Look at all that on your head. You don't think nothing fell out? It did. Do you remember moving the body? No. Yes, you do, Stephen. By August 2, 2011, police found enough evidence against Stephen McDaniel to charge him with the murder of Lauren Giddings. After being arrested, he spent the next three years in jail awaiting trial. The prosecution was seeking the death penalty until the FBI turned up the deleted stalking videos, the computer evidence, and the child pornography. They were a late discovery during the trial. Stephen's choice to plead guilty and accept a life sentence for the murder of Lauren Giddings came from the stock footage videos and sexual photos of minors, in addition to the other circumstantial and physical elements in his case. A death penalty case can typically take between five to seven years to go to trial, but the district attorney's office was willing to withdraw its request for the death penalty for faster closure because a trial could be dragged on for months. As part of the plea deal, prosecutors also agreed to drop the charges of sexual exploitation of children and burglary against Stephen in connection with the plea agreement. 
As a result of the investigation, those charges were also filed, but they have nothing to do with the murder. Therefore, they got what they wanted. Stephen would be in prison for the rest of his life, and in order to remain out of court, he handed in a handwritten confession detailing the last hours of Lauren Giddings' life as well as how her remains were disposed of. Today, Stephen McDaniel entered a guilty plea to the murder of Lauren Giddings. His guilty plea provides finality to this case and assures justice that cannot be undone. Even more, the guilty plea gives Lauren's family and friends answers that they have wanted and that they deserve. My goal since taking over this case has always been to get justice for Lauren, her family, and the community. Today's sentence does all those things and more. Because of this guilty plea, Stephen McDaniel will never again be able to deny that he and he alone is responsible for Lauren Giddings' death. As a part of this guilty plea, Stephen McDaniel was required to provide an allocution that is a detailed admission of guilt. This gives Lauren's family and friends answers that they have wanted since the day that he disappeared. Had we gone to trial, these details of his guilt would not have been required, even if Stephen McDaniel had been found guilty. We never would have known exactly what happened to Lauren. We never would have known how she died or what became of her body. We never would have had closure. It is my hope that confirming this information along with Stephen McDaniel's guilt will help Lauren's loved ones put aside the nagging mystery that often prevents a family from healing, even after they've obtained justice. Today's plea also provides finality and assurance that justice will not be undone. Had Stephen McDaniel been found guilty at trial, he would have been entitled to a series of appeals. Now he will not. There will be no worry that this case will one day be overturned on appeal. There will be no worry that old wounds will have to be reopened once again. All of that worry is now over. Certain justice finality, and the answers they deserve. These are the reasons Lauren's family support my decision to accept Stephen McDaniel's guilt rather than proceed to trial. I do not expect Stephen McDaniel to ever be released from prison, even though he has been sentenced to life with the possibility of parole. During the course of April 2014, Stephen wrote a confession in which he described Lauren's final evening alive and how he later dismembered and disposed of her body. Stephen's defence lawyer, who has made a career of representing vicious criminals, explains to the court that despite his best efforts, he could not represent Stephen after reviewing the horrific evidence retrieved from Stephen's apartment and computer. That up until the last couple of weeks of your case, I was strongly in your corner. But this computer evidence that came in, from the GBI, the fact that you uh, were peeking in this kidney's apartment, uh, that was that was very important. Uh, but the basis of plea was, was that kind of evidence that came in. Plus the graphic, specific, detailed confession that you made to Frank Hogue and I, which we were shocked about in the jail, and which you went into terrific detail about how you killed Laurie Giddings, how you went about decapitating her, carving of her body, how you even sat down and cut off every finger and thumb and appendage on her hands and threw them all in the toilet and flushed it at one time. Uh, and then combine that with 
the searches on the internet, the fact that you had done searches about having sex with dead people, things of that nature, all of that combined to a heavy, heavy evidentiary problem in your case. On top of that, you possess the most horrific child pornographic photos I've ever seen. And I've been practicing law for 33 years. Stephen entered Lauren's apartment using his master key at 4.30am on Sunday, June 26, 2011 and soundlessly defeated the burglar bar that Lauren had propped against her door. He watched her sleep. A floorboard squeaked as he approached the bed and Lauren sat up in alarm. When she saw the masked intruder, she calmly said, Get out of there. In his own words, Stephen said, I leapt across the bed onto her and grabbed her around the throat. We tumbled out of bed onto the floor and in her struggle to get away, she moved her legs and lower body under the bed, preventing her from getting away or kicking me. Lauren eventually managed to remove the mask from the attacker's face, allowing her to recognize him immediately. Stephen, she said. Please stop, but he didn't stop. He choked her until she stopped moving, which he estimated to be about 15 minutes later. After dragging her into the bathroom, he left the body in the bathtub. In the afternoon, Stephen returned to his apartment and spent most of the time on his computer. He returned to her apartment that evening with a hacksaw and began dismembering her body in the bathtub. The victim's head, arms and legs were removed, wrapped separately in several black garbage bags and then discarded in the dumpster at Mercer Law School. Stephen's mask, gloves and shirt that he had worn during the attack were cut up and flushed down the toilet. On the same day and the following day, he attended a bar exam preparation class. In the evening of Wednesday, June 29, Stephen joined a group of Lauren's friends and classmates in searching for the missing woman, knowing very well that he was responsible for her death. He later explained that he was in a dreamlike state and believed Lauren was still alive. A short time before Lauren's torso was discovered by Macon detectives, Stephen searched for a way to remove his browsing history on Thursday, June 30th. Lauren's head, arms and legs were not recovered. On April 21st, 2014, Stephen McDaniel was convicted of the murder of Lauren Giddings nearly three years after the crime. Until December 30th, 2016, he was housed at the prison in Bucks County, Georgia, which is the state's diagnostic and classification center for new inmates. He was transferred to Valdosta State Prison, located in southern Georgia, where he is currently being housed. The earliest Stephen will be eligible to request parole is in the year 2041. He will be 56 years old, but he is unlikely to ever be released given the extent and brutality of his crime. I do not expect Stephen McDaniel to ever be released from prison, even though he has been sentenced to life with the possibility of parole. The terms of this guilty plea require that Stephen McDaniel serve 30 years in prison before he can be first considered for parole in the year 2041. The heinous nature of this crime confirmed today in Stephen McDaniel's own words will follow him into any potential parole hearing. Because of the detailed admission of guilt, I do not expect any parole board will ever agree to his release. I fully expect Stephen McDaniel to spend the rest of his life behind bars. It is my belief that today's sentence and the specific admission of guilt that accompanied it will allow Lauren's family and friends to move forward with the healing process. My prayers will always be with them. As I noted earlier, Stephen McDaniel was a serial killer in the making. I say this with the utmost respect and condolences to Lauren and her family, but we have to be fortunate this predator only claimed one victim. I have no doubt in my mind that if Stephen was still a free citizen roaming the public, the murder count would be far greater than one.